Hi, my name is Bob Brown and welcome to my 8mm channel. This is a three-part series called How to Digitize Your 8mm Movies. And in this part one, I'm going to talk about how to convert your movies from film into a digital product, which is an MP4. Then, on top of that, I'm going to talk about file organization. That may seem kind of trivial, but it's really important, especially if you have multiple movies. You have to be organized. And in part two, I'll talk about how to lift your soundtrack from your movie, how to bring your files into your editor, and how to sync your soundtrack to your movie. Also, there's going to be something called drift, and that's where your movie goes out of synchronization. I'll show you how to fix that too. And in part three, I'll talk about the various types of film, such as Kodachrome and Ektachrome, because they do vary in quality and will require a little extra work on one more than the other. Well, actually a lot of extra work. Also, I'll do a down and dirty color correction, along with sharpening and a few extra tidbits. Oops! This is a quick insert, which I didn't plan on because I made an error in part three and I want to let you know ahead of time. And that is, I dealt with color in that one, color correction specifically, and I used a tool called the Color Warper. I have the paid version of DaVinci and I didn't realize it wasn't in the free version. So you're gonna to have to make those types of adjustments with the color wheels I mean, it's still very doable, and you might have to make a few other adjustments in different ways, like making selections for certain areas. But the alternative is just buy the full-blown program, and it's only $2.95. Upgrades are free forever. You never have to buy it again. I started with 17. 18 is out now, and when 19 comes out, I don't pay any more. But again, if you want to use the free version, you're just going to have to make certain adjustments with the color wheels and in other ways to work around the lack of a color warper tool. Again, I'm really sorry. I, I just, I had no idea. And when I found out, well, it was too late. And here I am making this insert. Anyway, sorry about that. Okay, let's get back to part one. Now, I don't know about you, but I've got a lot of home movies. For years, they just sat in a box. That box. They're really old. Okay, obviously not that old, but you get the idea. If I wanted to watch my movies today, I would have to have the exact same equipment I had back then. And I'm talking a lot of equipment. First, you'd need a film cartridge. Then, I would have to have a movie camera. And by the way, that was my movie camera. It was sound. Then you'd send it off to Kodak, and they would develop it. Once you got that back, you'd take that film, put it on the projector, and from the projector, you'd have to project it onto something. For example, a white sheet, a white wall, but in my case, I had that movie screen you see there. And then you'd watch the movie. That movie you're looking at right now, that's from 1953. It's my older brother. I'm going to show you three more short clips so you can see the end result from when you digitize your home movies. The first one was from 1963, and it's my sister and me. And that, I think, was shot on standard eight. That's right. And then the second one was from 1977, and it's a family holiday event. And that one was from 1977, and that was in sound. The third one was a silent movie shot in 1978, I think. And I added all the sound effects and everything else. 
And that's just to make the movie more fun. Let's take a quick look. As you just saw, those movies came out pretty good. And you can do that yourself. You can even make them more fun than they were originally by adding sound, sound effects, and music, and whatever you want to do. With today's technology, the possibilities are endless. And on top of that, you're preserving your family legacy, history, and you get to share it with whomever you choose. Now let's get down to the nuts and bolts of all of this. We're going to work with only two types of film. They kind of look the same, but they're not. It's the same size film, but the difference is one is regular 8, also known as standard 8, and the other one is super 8. The standard 8 has a larger sprocket and smaller aspect ratio, and super 8 has the opposite, a larger aspect ratio and smaller sprockets. In reality, the image covers most of the sprocket hole like this image. I didn't show it that way because I just wanted you to be able to see everything more clearly. I also included a magnetic stripe for sound so you can see what that looks like on the film. It's not going to be relevant when you go to digitize your movie. Now let's get down to the nitty gritty. We're going to need approximately three items and that is a digitizer, some way to get the sound off of your soundtrack if you have a sound film and some sort of editing program. I'm not going to worry about the sound or the editing aspects right now because I'm going to get into that later on. The only thing we're concerned about right now is the digitizer. There's many brands out there. I'm only going to talk about the one I have and I'm not going to go into huge detail on it because there's a million tutorials out there already that are really good on how to, I don't know, unbox it and use it. I happen to have this unit. It's the Wolverine Movie Maker Pro. It does 1080p at 20 frames per second, and it can do both regular 8 and super 8. Overall, I think the Wolverine did a surprisingly good job. Therefore, I do recommend it. Here are some of the downsides, though, and I want to talk about those. The first one is you do have to babysit the thing. That is, if you added some splices in there. It's also time-consuming because you do have to babysit it. Also, the other thing I don't like, there's a little too much compression for me. It kind of gives you like a, uh, a JPEG type of image, which looks great when you look at it, but when you go to edit it, there's not much data there to work with. For number four, I wish there was a raw format, an uncompressed option. This would allow for more dynamic range. You would be able to recover more detail in the darker areas and lighter areas. In other words, they won't get blown out. And for number five, I didn't realize it didn't work with a SD card above 32 gigabytes. I put a 64 in there and it wouldn't run at all. If you're one of those who likes to read the instructions, which I do, you're not going to be too pleased with the Wolverine's instructions. Clearly, whoever wrote it didn't have a very good command of the English language. They're brutal. I mean, brutal. But you still can figure everything out, but they're just, you know, come on. Anyway, here's the front side of it. It takes that 32 gigabyte 
SD card. On the back side, there's the SD slot. All you can do is just press it in there and you feel like a spring-loaded type of feel and it'll lock in. To get it out, you're going to do the exact same thing, only in reverse. You're just going to push in on it and it pops out. The default mount for a digitizer is regular rate film. It also accommodates Super 8, but you need an adapter. Here's a regular 8. The hole is a lot smaller than the Super 8. Here's the adapter. One goes on that end. The other goes on the other end. And the only other thing I can tell you is don't lose them no matter what you do, because if you do, there's no way for you to mount your Super 8 reels. Here's a suggestion you won't find in the manual. It's going to be really helpful, and you'll be glad you did this. And that is, buy a can of compressed air, open the film gate, and spray it every single time you put film into it. If you don't, you may end up with dust in there and what will happen is you'll have a beautiful shot of the dust on every single one of your frames. Here's all you have to do to clean that dust off. Open the film gate like that. And blow it out. I wasn't sure I was going to talk about this or not, but the more I thought about it, the more credence I gave it. And that is the relationship of your digitizer to your editor. And what is that exactly? It's file organization. You have an output from your digitizer that provides a file. Then that file has to go to the editor. It's really important to stay organized, and I'm just going to spend a little bit of time on showing you how I do that, and then we'll get into the digitizer itself. Your digitizer will generate a file number for every one of your movies. However, if for any reason your digitizer stops, like if it gets hung up or you have to stop it for any reason, and you're still on the same movie, then it will generate another number. For example, in this image you can see the file number is 00604. If for any reason you stop it, let's say you finish the movie, then the next movie will be 00605. Let's say your movie gets hung up for some unintended reason. It could be a bad splice, bad sprocket holes, it doesn't really matter. Every time you stop your digitizer, it will generate another number. So you could ultimately have several file numbers for the same movie. That's happened to me. This is why it's important to stay organized. I kind of made a file system for myself, and I'm going to share that with you now. You might have a better way, but this is just the way I do it. Let me show you. As you can see, I made three main folders. The first one is Wolverine Regular 8, the second one is Wolverine Super 8, and the last one is Wolverine Super 8 Sound. Every one of them has their own set of subfolders. All of the Wolverine Regular 8 subfolders begin with the number 2, the first one being 200, and then I identify it just so I recognize it along with the year. I don't write the frames per second on my regular 8 folders, and that's because I already know all regular 8 movies were shot at 16 frames per second. The subfolders in the Wolverine Super 8 all begin with the number 1, the first one being 101, Cows, Deland, 1977, and I identify the frame rate, and that was 24 frames per second. The Wolverine Super 8 sound subfolders all begin with the number 0, in this case, the first one begins with 000, 8mm audio files. That's where I keep all of the WAV files. Those WAV files are the files I pulled off of the soundtracks for the various movies. 
So inside of 001 is Mr. Metropolitan competition, and that's 18 frames per second. But the associated WAV file will also be 001. I hope that was helpful. That's how I stay organized. Everything goes into a single folder. One movie in one folder, another movie in another folder. Everything related to that movie goes in that folder. I label it so I recognize it. And then I do the same thing for the next folder. Now let's get back to the digitizer. This is going to be just a brief explanation of the switches and buttons. The first one is a toggle switch and it allows you to select either Super 8 or Regular 8. That next switch is the gate release. It simply opens the gate so you can put the film in. That first button on the left is the power button. It simply turns the unit on and off. The next button, it's the menu button and it selects various pages in the menu system. That button with the up arrow on it allows you to navigate upward or to the left. It just depends on what you select in the menu. To the right of that one, it does the same thing, but in the opposite direction. It allows you to navigate down or to the right. The last button, the one all the way to the right, it starts and stops the digitizer. It also makes menu selections, depending on what page you're on in the menu system. I know this might seem obvious, but make sure you don't have any twists in your film coming from the film spool to the gate. Because if there's a twist, there's a good chance that you'll damage that film. Now there are three tabs in the film gate. The film has to go under each one of those tabs. When you do it, make sure you just slightly twist the film and tuck it under each one of those tabs. The sprocket holes should be away from you. I suggest you don't connect your white leader to the take-up reel. That might sound a little odd, but there's a reason for that. The take-up reel is motorized and it continues to turn. So if your film gets hung up in any way, that reel is going to keep pulling that film through and damage it. You don't want that to happen, obviously. So what do you do? You just let the film run off into a waste paper basket. I'm going to show you a little bit more about that a little bit later. When you first turn on your digitizer, you'll be greeted with a blue splash screen. This is normal. Then the next screen you'll see is your last saved settings. That's the image you'll have when you go to start your digitizer. Even if you power your unit off, you can even take the plug out of the wall. It doesn't really matter because it will maintain its settings. What I want to talk about next is the settings themselves. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on how to navigate through the various pages and stuff like that. You can do that on your own. It's pretty simple. However, there is a very specific kind of framing you need to have within your viewer. Let's go over that right now. This is how I suggest you frame your movie inside of that viewer. That yellow line shows the frame within the viewer. Notice it's kind of crooked. It's rotated a little clockwise. Don't worry about that because that gets fixed in the editing process. The top arrow shows the upper frame line. Anything above that is a different image. The same thing with the lower arrow. Anything below that frame line is a different image. The one on the right is just the right edge of the film. The one on the left shows the sprocket hole. You should be able to see that. I'll go over the reasons for that in just a moment. That's just there to show you how the areas in the viewer translate from the film strip. If you haven't already done so, go ahead and select the power button. This will obviously power the unit on. At that point, select the mode button. When you do that, you can now make some changes on the pages. Scroll down with the down arrow and go all the way till you see Frame Adjust. Once you're there, use the button all the way to the right where it says Enter 
and select that, and that will bring you to the Adjust page. At that point, you'll have three adjustments. The X adjustment allows you to move the image left or right. Underneath the X, you'll see the Y adjustment. That allows you to move the image up or down. Then there's the W adjustment at the very bottom. That allows you to zoom in or zoom out of the image. In other words, enlarge it or make it smaller. There are a few more adjustments inside of the Wolverine, such as sharpening, focus, and some other things in there I can't remember offhand. But I wouldn't mess with the sharpening or anything like that because I would do it in the editing program, which is how I did it anyway. Then, when you're all through making your adjustments, just simply select the Mode button again, and you'll go back to the very original screen when you turn the unit on. If you really want to save a lot of time, and you have the Wolverine, you can always just copy those numbers. I assume all of your adjustments would be the same as mine. Earlier I mentioned to let your film run into a trash can. Well, the reasons for that are very simple. It creates no resistance. I know I mentioned a little of that earlier, but I want to go over it again because it is pretty important. And that is, don't use the take-up reel. It always moves and always has tension. And if anything gets hung up on your film, it will pull it and snap it. You want to avoid that. There's no resistance when you just let it flow into the trash can. Here it is in action. And that's all there is to it. You still have to rewind your movie, obviously. So here's how you do that. It's quite simple and it's fast. Well, that's pretty much it for part one. We went over how to digitize and organize folders. In part two, we're gonna deal with sound, grabbing the soundtrack and editing the soundtrack. Well, I hope to see you in the next one.